Great. Um, good morning, DES 570. I am so delighted to be here with Gaver Tully, who is an old friend and a wonderful design thinker and educator um, who connects his students to the real world in a way that I find so inspiring and so important these days. And he um, is the founder of the Tinkering School, which is a camp, uh, but has all sorts of forms, uh, fabulous ways to connect with it. And he's also the founder of Brightworks, which is a K through 12 uh, school, not just an elementary school anymore, but has grown to include middle school and high school now. And I think Gaver just told me that one of his uh, graduates has um, joined the program uh, at San Francisco State, the design program at State. So that's very exciting. Um, I think the thing that th this connection to the world that teaching through problem solving with real materials and real tools, it starts at an early age with Gaver and he'll tell you all about that, is something that's so important for us to think about as we sit around building with electrons all day long. Um, so Gabriel, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Um, and maybe you can kind of give us the background on Tinkering School and Brightworks, and then maybe go back to how you got to Tinkering yeah. School, just a little bit of your, your journey. Yeah, well, let's start with Tinkering School, because that's definitely like a, a turning point in my life that I look back at as like, you know, went way out on a limb with a with a personal vision of something fully committed. And then it, it realized into something wonderful and changed my life forever. Um, so um, I'm uh, not gonna do a presentation here, but just um, share with you uh, a couple of images um, from the early days of Tinkering School. And, and, and this photo is one that I've seen now probably a hundred thousand times. And, um, and, and I just don't get tired of it because it's the very first cohort of young students that I worked with as an educator in an official, like, I'm being an educator in this moment. <laughs> you know, I had mentored a lot of young people. I was at the time the um, chief architect of a software company, a startup in San Francisco, and was at this moment in my career where I had worked on a lot of different kinds of companies and worked on a lot of different kinds of projects and was doing everything I could possibly do with software. And, um, and I just one summer launched this program where these eight kids came and stayed in my guest room in bunk beds that we bought at Ikea. And like we assembled the whole experience out of duct tape and, and um, you know, wood scraps practically. And, and it was fantastic and transformative for all of us. I am still connected to many of these kids because of what it was like working together. And what I tell people is that they are the co-authors of this learning experience, right? I didn't know what I was doing. And so I left a lot of what we were gonna do unwritten so that, you know, I could just see how it was going. And it turned out having a conversation with the students is what helped us design the rest of Tinkering School that week and the rest of my life. <laughs> so, and it's um, actually a very different model for teaching. It's not you being the teacher up there. It's a very collaborative, collaborative yeah. process. Yeah. In fact, I had this one project at the beginning, which I, I, I had no idea how long it would take us. So on the very first day, we started to build this bridge from the deck of my studio where I am now over to a nearby tree about 20 feet away. And, and uh, I think in my mind, I had thought it was gonna take us a couple of days to do this. And then in doing that, we'd sort of look at how much time we had left. And maybe by then I would have come up with something that was appropriate to finish out the week with. Well, they finished it. it uh, we were done building the bridge by lunchtime <laughs> on the first day and uh, we uh, what became a kind of tradition at tinkering school was let's put everybody on it and see if we can break it right and so we were able to put all the kids on it and then we were able to add the staff and and the bridge just kept holding up and 
what this recalibrated for me almost instantly was the the um, the intuitive sense that I had that also helped me start the camp was that people underestimate how productive kids can be when they're working on something that they care about, like intrinsically, you know, they wanted to see this bridge work, they wanted to see it done, they wanted to get to the tree, this was going to be a big celebration. And, um, and the fact that we had, we were there by lunchtime was kind of, <laughs> I think we were all shocked at how quickly it came together and how well it worked. Also uh, the efficiency of power tools, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that was something, you know, every student had a electric screwdriver, you know, for drilling and all the pieces of wood had been this huge pile of little rectangles of plywood, like a set of Lego. Because in the very first year, I wasn't really comfortable using the, the chop saw and the table saw with the kids. I hadn't myself learned how to introduce those kinds of tools. So the first year, we pre-cut everything and built it out of those wooden Lego kind of. Um, well, the next year, one of those students came back, and uh, he found this cardboard box in the garage, and he... Um, I, it was on like the second or third day, and I said, Harlow, what, do you, uh, what are you working on? And because um, he hadn't come down to the studio in a couple of hours. And he said, oh, I'm building a boat. And there was an older student there um, helping me get some tool out of the garage, I think. And, and uh, the older student looks at it and he says, hey, Harlow, like, I'm worried that if you put your boat in water, it's going to get all soggy, you know. And uh, Harlow pulls out the plastic liner bag that had been around this flat panel TV that had come in the box. And, uh, and he's like, well, you know, maybe this could work. And so the two of them spawned this boat project. And um, what I and I, I talked to Harlow a few years ago, he's now, a, you know, um, uh, in college. And uh, he, I guess he's out of college. Wow. Um, he <laughs> what he remembers is when I said, Harlow, if you finish that boat by Friday, we'll take it down to the harbor and put it in the shark infested waters of the Pacific Ocean. And that narrative element of the shark infested waters, like he was going to dare this, uh, you know, dangerous undertaking in this boat that he was making out of cardboard and tape, that he remembers like how it galvanized his attention and it focused and they ended up building a much better boat. And in fact, everybody at the camp that session got a chance to paddle around in this boat before it did turn into a bag of soggy cardboard. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> this just highlighted for me how what they needed more than more than an adult to tell them what to do, what they needed was a context where these ideas could develop. And so over the years, I started doing less and less of the scripting and just letting the projects come out of what materials do we have. So when I was, we had run to the hardware store to get more screws, Hannah saw this pile of broken lawnmower equipment on the side of the road. And she was like, let's take this back to the camp and see if we can get one of these lawnmowers to work. We were able to get one of the weed whacker motors to work and she launched this project to build a motorcycle. So we call it the world's most dangerous motorcycle. And, uh, and, and by the end of the week, we had this crazy sort of Mad Max motorcycle working and everybody got a chance to drive it around in a local parking lot. Um, similarly, uh, when this railroad between Davenport and Santa Cruz was, ab was officially abandoned, uh, well. uh, I started a conversation the, that year with a couple of kids, and we came up with a project for the next summer when they came back, which was to build these sail-powered railroad cars. Um, we called them rail boats. <laughs> and, uh, and they built their rail boats, and then I dropped them off in Davenport and I said, if you get to Santa Cruz, there's pizza waiting for you. Wow. 
And it took them seven hours, some of them to cross the 11 miles from Davenport to Santa Cruz. They had to drag their boats. One of the boats broke completely and they just had to make a neat pile of materials and then hike the rest of the way. But there was no one who accepted a ride from the truck. Everybody had to get to Santa Cruz. And, um, and that was where I realized too, th there is, a, a deep reservoir of tenacity in every student. And it comes out when they're fully and committed, fully engaged with the project. And the reason that um, uh, sometimes people give up on a project is because they felt like it was imposed from the outside and they're just doing it for the grade, they're just doing it for the credit. But if you can figure out for yourself uh, what I discovered is if you can figure out for yourself how to connect with this project and really authentically care in your own heart about how it comes out, the work that you do is so much better. And so... And it seems that that caring is tied to a narrative of some sort, a narrative, some kind of storytelling that yeah. is important to, to you. Yeah, um, that's right. I, I, I think that you know, we live in a kind of fictional world that we construct in real time inside our brains. But, um, but in reality, you know, we need a reason to care about something, you know, it, it, you know, right now I'm learning calculus and, and I'm doing it because I want to be able to have conversations with some of my students who are really good at it. And I missed that part of mathematics when I was growing up. And, uh, um, so I have a reason for doing it, but I often find when I'm talking with other adults, they're like, why are you learning calculus? It's like, I feel a void where I would love to be able to have these better, deeper conversations. But can I jump in, um, Gator, yeah. and ask you, while you were working in those, um, after you missed your calculus class, which <laughs> I have to say was one of my favorite classes as a senior in high school, I had a wonderful calculus teacher. Um, but did you, were you, a, did you build things as you like were working in the software companies and trying to kind of do that, you know, build companies and what we're all supposed to be doing, I guess, were you I, someone who had always had a shop and had tools at your disposal or was that? I, um, yeah, that's a really good question because I, I think um, the like the launching of Tinkering School and taking over my yard and my life the way that it did, um, I uh, I feel like um, uh, I feel like that was a response to a kind of internal constipation that I had because my entire life was digital, right? Everything I was working on, yeah. um, you know, it, I could have been working on special effects and it was making movies. But ultimately, I felt like all of those things were intangible, right? And I had this real desire. And I have always been a person who is comfortable with tools. I, my, uh, the family I grew up in, the, um, the sort of community that I lived in was a lot of um, home builders and makers of various kinds and craftspeople and artists. And, and I think that I've always been very comfortable but I'd never made that a focus, mm -hmm. you know, but I did definitely like, you know, if something broke, I had a tendency to take it apart and try to figure out why it broke. Um, I, I think that um, I'm also, I'm easily fascinated by simple physical phenomena, you know, like I, I love, um, I, I'll, I'll show you a quick example. I, I have a little box of hex nuts. I, I bought it at the hardware store on an impulse because they're big and they're they're perfect. beautiful. They're so yeah, beautiful. They're perfect hexagons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if I if I just tip this just a little bit, I, this way that they fit together, I I just find like pleasing and fascinating, you know, and so. I have spent endless hours, you know, with my microphone muted in Zoom uh -huh. kind of meetings and things where I'm listening, but I have these to play with while I, um, 
Well, and I think that brings this kind of this childish play, the importance of play as a yeah. discovery mechanism is something you've never yeah. lost, Gaver, and you've yeah. managed to connect to realize, oh, I should work with children. I mean, was there also, <laughs> I mean, I know tinkering school kind of formalized that, oh, yeah. working with children is a great way to explore these design ideas or does the way we build or think. It is, and because, um, you know, kids don't have that inner editor fully developed that's telling them like, oh, everything I'm writing right now is just garbage. Why would anybody, um, uh, why would anybody um, read this or, right. you know, or like this or my drawings are crap and all of those things? No, but this is a drawing of a gorilla who lives in a milk carton and and it is what I say it is because that's what I need it to be right now. And that, um, that work with kids really reconnected me with those creative impulses and giving them room. And so I think that's something that a lot of my friends and coworkers often comment on when they're trying to describe me to someone else. They say, oh, he's very playful, he's very, um, he's always fooling around with things, you know. Um, it, it's because that satisfies a kind of um, uh, curiosity that I've not just had, but like developed. Because, exactly. yeah, I and I do the same whether I'm working with adults or kids, and and. Um, but I think I that's a really interesting point of taking something that is. Ba core to you, but you, that you have to develop it. It takes, we're yeah. talking, it, it's a practice. It is That's your right. practice, your artistic practice. I mean, in my world as an artist, I think <laughs> everybody's an artist. Nobody's not an artist, but it takes work. It takes a little bit of practice to nurture those passions yeah. and send them in the direction that. Well, I, th I think when your work, and this happened with Tinkering School too, the first <clears throat> the first year, kind of a fluke. We were lucky. We kind of hit it out of the park. Um, the second year, a little bit more work to, to kind of get there. I overthought it, right? I, I was trying to be too um, teacherly almost, right? Third year, a little bit better. Fourth year, another like tough year because I couldn't quite figure out I couldn't quite figure out how to manage a group of kids who weren't committed to each other. Like my, my ability to shape the community of learners mm -hmm. you know, who I was working with in that given camp, it stands out in my memory to this day as like the sudden realization of it doesn't matter how good the project is. If, the, if we're not knitted together, if we're not mutually committed, then the work doesn't, who cares, mm -hmm. right? Like we might as well pause what we're trying to do, not force the deadline and actually work out how we're going to work together. And, and then I will, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, all part of the, the design process. Yeah, exactly. So, so wow. So yeah. go on with the story of Tinkering School and maybe get to the Mars project because that's such oh, yeah. a kind of interesting culmination of this camp that's been so based. It's a summer camp. It's outside. It's you did progress to using um, uh, table saws and chop saws yeah. and stuff with your young with young kids. Yeah, which is very empowering. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's, a, there's a photo. Um, that I love that shows me operating a chainsaw, but actually I just have my hands on top of the hands of a seven-year-old girl who's cutting a redwood tree, uh, you know, in our shop with a chainsaw. <laughs> and, and, and I'm just there as safety, but she's the one who's cutting. And uh, she has this like, you know, like this full intense look in her eyes, like, oh my God, I'm cutting a tree. And, uh, it's moments like that too, where you're fully, you're fully engaged in that moment. The rest of the world has disappeared. Time has somehow stretched out in this beautiful way. And, and you're noticing all these things, the smell of the sawdust and the oil, you know, from the chainsaw and the, um, the, 
the way that like she's almost shaking, you know, with excitement before she's even turned on the saw, you know, all of those things come to you in a way that I think informs, um, you know, future experiences. These are like the foundational elements, you know, like sometimes I think about my visual vocabulary, like what, what are shapes that I'm comfortable drawing and that I can recall without looking at a photo? You know, like, I, you know, I can draw a person, I can draw a car, you know, th these are all things that are accessible to me. I think in the same way that we have a visual vocabulary, there's an experiential vocabulary. And what are the experiences that I can build from that I can recall with such detail that I don't need to re-experience them in order to describe them, in order to share them, or in order to create that experience for someone else? And um, uh, Tinkering School has been in this incredible factory of experience, of, you know, for children. And I know this because we've been doing it for 15 years. And um, when COVID hit, um, we were just getting ready for a summer program that was full, it was going to be nine weeks of overnight camp, uh, 10 weeks of the, after of the uh, day camp up at our campus in San Francisco, and three weeks of what we called Tinkering School Adventures, which is a small group of kids who've kind of been at Tinkering School for a few years, go and do some kind of insane project, you know, like out in a desert, we've done, we built a 28 foot sailboat in nine days in upper Michigan. Um, I saw it, follow that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we, uh, last summer, we went out to the Bonneville Salt Flats and we built a giant wind powered, we called it the land ship, um, is a wind powered Winnebago essentially that we could all live inside oh. and, uh, uh, and then the weather turned against us. <laughs> um, but, uh, COVID like hit we had a few desperate weeks of trying to figure out if we were still gonna to get to have camp, no. And then suddenly I realized like, what is life gonna be like for children when they can't go outside, when they can't connect with their peers, they can't share play activities except through this kind of experience. And, uh, and so I just, I had a scrap of an idea and what I'd love to do, and I just realized I could do is show you the like four slide presentation I used to pitch the idea to a bunch of tinkering school students of like, you know, we can't have camp and, you know, I, you know, I can't charge any money for this, but if you wanted to volunteer your time, we could try to build this together. So let me show you what yeah, that is. Yeah, I'm so I'm on tender hooks. Yeah. Um, here it is. I found it. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I threw together these slides, uh, partly because I didn't know what I was going to do with my summer, right? Right. It, yeah. I was in this yeah. like crisis very, very moment. Time. Uh, so I, I, I wrote this and I send it out as a PDF because the kids are all in different time zones. And, you know, I said, there's a very re real possibility that um, summer is gonna be messed up, right? And uh, I have an idea and I called it plan B. And here's the story. The first colony ship has departed for Mars, but there's a big problem. And this is all just like pictures I stole off the internet to assemble right. the but there's a big problem. The pre-arrival ship has crashed and all of the specialized automated colony building stuff is broken. The only thing that still works are these burly loaders. They're, they're like um, forklifts and you know just these like construction equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, to make matters worse, the ship has crashed on the wrong side of a deep canyon. And so we're gonna have to remote control these construction equipment that are meant to be used like in warehouses and things like that. And somehow with these inappropriate tools, we're gonna build a bridge and build a safe habitat for the colony ship, which is already on its way. 
Ah, oh, this was the pre-stuff, right, okay. This is the backstory. Right. So designed to be operated in real time by a local maintenance crew, these simple machines are meant only for moving cargo and, uh, and falling into ravines. <laughs> but there are 12 of them, and somehow we've got to build a safe place for the colony ship to land. And then, um, yeah, backstory, you know, we're going to use the space hypernet to control them. So I proposed this new program we'd never had before called the Mars Mission, right? And I took a wild stab at how I thought it would work. It turned out, it, like, as we worked out the details, all of these list of to-do items changed. But yeah. this is the actual Tinkercad sketch we had of, the, of what we thought we were about to try and make, right? And we're going to make 20 of them, and they're going to be in this, you know, giant crater. And I'm researching to figure out where we can build this giant crater, right? Mm -hmm. And... and uh, Number one, nobody wants to rent me a bare piece of land that I can dig a crater in. And also my board is panicked because we're about to incur a huge number of expenses in response to COVID. And, right. you know, like we need to save that money for the school year and all of these like real world constraints. But what I can have is this empty, unused music room on the campus. Hmm. And it's about... Uh, 40 feet wide and 60 feet long. So it's not nothing. It's a right. reasonably yeah. big room. Yeah. And uh, um, wait till you see this. We, like, sure. by no means a polished presentation. No, so I love it. It's at, great. at the beginning, we're starting, we're sketching. Can you see my cursor? I can't tell. Yes, yes, oh, I can okay. see your cursor. Yeah. Great, perfect. So at the beginning, we're just sketching in our notebooks and sharing these sketches. We're using Discord to coordinate because everybody's in quarantine, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're building these like hideous prototypes out of simple materials. There's even a, there's a cardboard version of what we think the robot's gonna be. And we're talking to um, professionals and we actually got the attention of this planetary geologist who helped us understand like how lava tubes on Mars work because we've gone from building a crater to building something that would be much smaller. And what we came up with was a lava tube, which is one of the places they're thinking about building habitats on Mars. So we're like, all right, that's constrained. We can build that. But I think it's really to point out here how important that research is and to finding yeah. the professional and getting this really great information. Yeah, because none of us are experts in any of this. Right. right? And suddenly we're starting to use terms like regolith right which is any loose like the earth is covered in regolith it's a loose soil material that's not attached as a rock mm -hmm. that's regolith right, right and right. can contain small rocks so so i'm taking notes you know we're we're starting to do that we're starting to build up a story and it's getting storyboarded right so we have these like storyboards that anna was working on they're trying to figure out how do we tell the backstory and engage people in driving robots around in our model of Mars. But then we finally get to a point where we got to build this thing, right? We empty all the, st this storage room, re takes us two weeks to empty and find homes for all the stuff in storage. Then we're buying lumber, right? Wow. And we have this super limited budget, uh, you know, f like uh, $1,200 for materials at this point. And it, it, suddenly we're like, how are we gonna build robots? Um, we're starting to figure out like, how, how do we engage people's attention to like sell it as a camp? So there's a whole like marketing aspect starting that's like, how do we get people to sign up to go to this camp that doesn't exist and we don't even know if it's gonna work yet. <laughs> but <laughs> our robots are starting to get like real. And um, I love this photo. We've got 3D printed wheels here. It, it takes like nine hours to print a set of wheels. It's way too much wow. time. And you can see our robot is just filling up with sand. The wheels just dig into the sand and they throw sand. Turns out we had the completely wrong idea about how to drive on sand. Uh, but we're also getting these beautiful artifacts that are kind of like, it's these little moments that are letting us know that like we're onto something. And it, it's funny, it's not the things we thought it was gonna be. We keep having these like ephemeral throwaway kind of 
realizations were like, holy crap, we're driving on Mars, you know. Um, we're starting to work out how we're going to build the crash spaceship. And you can see behind here, the lava tube is starting to take shape. And can you mention, mention just a little bit what tools you have at your disposal oh, in terms of a, a 3D printer or? Yeah. So uh, one of the kids has a 3D printer at home. And, um, and so we've been using that. At the school, we have a laser cutter. You do? So okay. Owen is holding up some laser cut uh, cardboard here as a prototype of uh, part of the spaceship. And then uh, the rest of this is Home Depot lumber. It's the cheapest, thinnest veneer plywood they sell. So it's like, you know, $9 a sheet for these four by eight uh, Luan uh, sheets. And then these are like two by three frameworks that we just kind of like figured out how to build by doing some experiments and then started to line the whole thing out, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but I also want to point out that you always have your sketchbooks. It seems like you're 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 sketching ideas and iterating all the time, all the time with yeah. just and, very rough sketches, and um, and then you're going into what program interfaces with the laser cutter. Um, so it depends on who you're talking to as to what we use. Uh, so the laser cutter takes um, SVG files, vector art. And uh, so we generate those. Uh, I like to make mine in Illustrator. That's the tool I'm most comfortable in for that. Right. Um, uh, some of the students are using Fusion 360 to generate from 3D models right into oh. cut files for the laser cutter. So like these wheels here come uh, start out in Fusion 360 and then all the individual parts are laid out in SVG as extracts from the Fusion 360 model. Yeah. Um, and this ended up being how we built our wheels because we could produce them much faster. Right, of so, course, yeah. No, what a great, yeah, iteration yeah, there. Create them, yeah. And they look awesome. I mean, they look really like industrial, you know? And uh, so, so that's a factor, but the, um, we also have students who are using online vector drawing tools. Mm -hmm. There are so many amazing um, art tools now that are just available in the browser. Right. So one of our students, Onion, working from home, did a lot of work just because they didn't have um, they didn't have uh, Illustrator installed, mm -hmm. and their laptop wouldn't support it anyway. It, I mean, it was right. it would have been too slow. So construction starts, um, there's some like real complicated logistics that come in, which is we're about to receive 6,000 pounds of simulated reg Martian regolith. Because yeah. we've worked out with a planetary scientist what to order from the landscaping company. And it arrives in these one ton bags and there's three of them. <laughs> and our lava tube though is starting to look like some kind of uh, like um, like like a crazy pink wave <laughs> as it comes together. But we're starting to see it and we're talking about it from this point on as if it's real, right? And we're also, we're only about at this point about two months away from the first kids who've signed up and paid for a camp and this is where we are. So <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Um, we're, we're definitely pushing the limits of proper COVID protocol at this point, but we've got all the windows open, there's fans going, it's very high circulation, everybody's in masks. Mm -hmm. And, um, and luckily we had no, uh, COVID cases in our work group. Uh -huh. So, uh, and you can see the, the robot is starting to evolve. The burlies are starting to have personality and functionality. So this is the beginning of working out how the bulldozer scoop works. Um, I'll just sort of go quickly. Oh, one of the things we started doing a lot of was doing design iterations right on top of using things like Procreate or other yep. iPad based drawing tools Yeah. to dry, draw right on top of a photograph to talk about um, how we were going to make the next iteration of changes. Yeah. Right. And that was a really powerful way to work at a distance because Someone could go in, assemble the laser cut, take pictures, 
then from home, we would drive that robot around and then draw on top of the pictures to agree on what the next iteration would look like. And then someone would update the Fusion 360 model or the Illustrator file, do those cuts and we could do another iteration. So we, we would have like one or two people at the site on any given day, but they would often be doing tasks on behalf of other people working from home. So right. that was really, uh, I, I was really amazed. But you can see like, sketches from the notebooks include things like working out how that ship would crash or lay over the lava tube, how the two ends of the lava tube fit together. Um, it's a really like doing these very lightweight iterations turned out to be really important in um, getting to a working system. And when we, uh, when we first started putting the sand and the decomposed granite in, we suddenly saw like a movie set. It was starting to come together. And then that movie set quality uh, got us to change how we talked about it because we started to talk about how does this look not to us as a oversized adult human standing in the tube, right. but how does it look to the robot? Yeah, as a scale model. As a scale model. Yeah, and so that let us get away with a lot of things that when you walk into the lava tube and you look around, you're like, you know, this is a kind of funky set. But when you look at it from the point of view of the robot, yeah. it's you're there on Mars. And um, it's, uh, it's just like iterations after iterations. These are just photos that everybody took while they were working on it. And, uh, you know, we have this like, manufacturing process where once we finalized the robot design, we had to make 22 of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that process was just sheer effort and hours. A lot of the manufacturing went home like cottage industry. Kids would at home assemble, you know, 88 tires. And then, yep. you know, those would come back in a few days later and get assembled onto chassis, right? And then as we started to beat up these robots, they started to express the feel we were hoping for, which is that like a little bit of industrial grittiness, you know, and um, we were able to start taking pictures. There's, there's an aesthetic that's, that creeps in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which I love. Because we looked at a lot of photographs of um, industrial equipment to see how it wears and then you know, the other big problem was the ceiling is covered with fluorescent lights and doesn't look like a Mars sky. And we did a series of experiments to try and figure out how to create a sky. And we ended up using this, the thing that worked best was this cheap plastic, uh, slightly translucent white painter's tarp, you know, that you just buy at a hardware store. And when we stretch that over, if the cameras on the robots were adjusted to see in the black lava tube, then the sky would be blown out. It would just be a white, right. continuous white. And our goal was to use lights above to tint it. We never got that working, but also it looks like we didn't need to. Like people are so focused on the work in front of the robot they're driving that mm -hmm. Nobody has ever commented that the sky is only ever white. <laughs> yeah, it, it just it turned out not yeah. to be a critical thing. Right. Uh, there's, uh, you know, like the every step we take now, we get closer to seeing it. And you can see we've added the wreckage from the spaceship. Oh my God, the narrative is really, it's like building a movie set. I mean, it really it, is. It's just like building a movie set. and. And we, we're we starting to work out narratives for each week of camp, the progress that they'll make and the things that they'll undertake. And um, when we finally, like the whole, uh, this isn't all 22 of them, but when you get them all together and you put them in here, um, we, we started, this is where we finally started to breathe like a little bit easier, but this was literally a week before camp started. <laughs> that that we felt like we had enough of them to to run camp right mm -hmm. and, and there was enough of a there there 
but there were there were all kinds of things that still needed work. And if I just scroll back here, like for the first two weeks of camp, we just had this black plastic tarp at the end, and we were like, just don't let's hope nobody talks about it. You yeah. know, we have like one of those weekends we managed to get the resources together and build fake rock tumble uh, out of foam. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, so talk a little bit, Gaver, about this, because it's still unclear now when camp, the 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 way the students or, or the, the campers are going to be uh, interacting with all of this stuff that you have now prepared. And I see that your wheels are different, a different design here. Yeah. I, I, with the final uh, one. So this is a really good, uh, this is a change to the robot based on running a couple of weeks of camp. And we realized that the earlier design was still churning up too much of the material. The paddles were digging in. And so we reached out to the Mars Curiosity Rover team. And we, we made contact with Alicia, the woman who manages the Curiosity Drive team. Wow. They're the people who plan every day's work on Mars for the Curiosity rover. And we got her into a robot and she and her husband drove around in the robots for half an hour. And we we started to have a conversation. They were remotely driving these robots in your music room. Yeah. 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 The people who drive on Mars wow. were driving in our robots and wow. without any lag. And that's the thing they kept talking about was like, Oh my God, I'm just, I send a command and it responds. It's fantastic. It's not 36 million. It's not 40 minutes. Day. Yeah, okay. for 80 minutes at the worst case. And um, so we start talking with Alicia and, and she's like, oh, you know, you're, um, when, when JPL first started designing rovers, we, we too, we, we explored these paddles and we quickly realized that you need to float on top of the, material you yeah. want to you want to disturb as little of the material as you need to to get traction mm -hmm. and so uh we call these the waffle the waffle tread wheels and th they revolutionize the experience in camp of going from getting stuck three or four times a day when you were driving a robot as a camper mm -hmm. right to um getting work done being able to actually clear rocks and make roadways and things like that. And it was it was paying attention to that camper experience and their feedback about what that last session of camp had been like that we focused all of our attention on upgrading the wheels. Mm -hmm. And 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 so that was a beautiful thing. So here's how here's how it basically works. If um if I bring up uh tinkeringschool.com slash Mars and share that. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Okay, so imagine you're a parent and you've heard me on the radio talking about Mars, or um, uh, which I happen to do an NPR interview, a KQED interview, um, nice. right before we launched. But uh, but we also we sent an email out to all the parents who'd ever gone to tinkering school, and we we're like, hey, everybody's summer is messed up we're offering this as a hands-on online camp where you don't need anything at home except a laptop. And parents were sort of intrigued by this idea of like, how does my child go to a build-oriented camp, mm -hmm. but all they need is a laptop, but it's not Minecraft, which there were suddenly thousands of Minecraft offerings as online camps. And, um, uh, and this is how it works. The, the camp program is a week at camp for a kid, four hours a day. Uh, you've got Zoom going in and you've got a web browser open with the robot interface, with the, with the interface that you're driving on Mars. And uh, you sign up for it just like any other camp. And then you drive the robot. And I just scrolled down here and I'll sort of zoom in. This is uh, approximately the uh, robot interface right here. Mm -hmm. Is these are the controls that you see. It tells you the identifier of your robot. It tells you your identifier. You are 10-81 in the 
in the narrative. And then a reminder of how to control your robot right here. And there's other things you can do to actuate the arm and all those things. But, but there was a very simple kind of graphical user interface that would remind you of which keys to use. Mm -hmm. But for kids who were operating from tablets, which we had a bunch of, they could just tap on those keys to operate the interface. Wow. So you That's could either be on a tablet or a laptop. Yeah. Yeah. And we had actors who played <clears throat> characters in the narrative. And each camp session would start with a with a video update from one of these actors. Sometimes it was the captain of the ship. Uh, sometimes it was um, a crew member who was working on something and needed you to uh, to like focus your attention that day on getting the landing pad ready, right? You know, those kinds of things. So um, we, uh, we invested a lot in designing so that your session in camp would feel like a episode of a sci-fi TV series. Mm -hmm. So you'd have your own goals and things like that. But that's basically, <clears throat> what we sold that summer and we sold five weeks of camp. We had intended to sell the whole summer, but that's, <laughs> you know, uh, it took us that long to build everything and get it all working. And then- um, but, but that the app design and the interface design was important, as important as this physical design. I mean, that yeah. was the way, of course, you know, this interface with, with your world. That's so exactly right. And, and building and, that story and even to the extent of hiring actors and making and there had to be an aesthetic stuff. that yeah. carried that made the robots look like they were part of a family of tools that would be used on Mars. And yeah. Yeah. So uh, this winter with the COVID restrictions and everything in place, we did the same thing again. We're, we're working on generation two of the robot experience. So new robots that are easier to maintain because those ones, when they broke, we pretty much had to like take everything apart. Wow. Mm -hmm. And the new robots are a clamshell design where you undo two latches and the whole inside opens. All the motors and batteries are on one side and all the electronics are on the other. And it's a beautiful and like a piece of industrial design. Nice. Yeah. And it, because of that design, the rovers look different, right? Yeah. But because the design change serves a purpose, the rover looks intentional. It's not just like made up sci-fi goo -ga. Yeah. It's, it's designed this way because on Mars, this is how they work on machines, right? Mm -hmm. Everything weighs less. So you can have this giant heavy piece of equipment that you open like a clam. Wow, wow, right, right. <laughs> Cool. So, so that will be our, that's Mars 2.0. Mars 2.0. Mars, Rover, Mars, Mars yeah, yeah. Robots 2.0. Oh, I can't wait to see those. Yeah. Well, maybe since we're talking about machines, yeah. maybe Gaver, you could transition to, so alongside Tinkering School, you have been making a series of what we might call toys, but objects that can be in the home and can help. Yeah. Kids or grown-ups build things, and um, you, so, you can explain what they are and what your new walk us through your newest one because it's great. Yeah. And I, I'll try to keep it brief because I could talk forever about these things. Um, so we we call the concept or the product line we call it a catalyst because, like we were talking about earlier, where curiosity needs to be developed and kind of encouraged and stoked. Um, we thought of this as like, what could you put in a box to send home that would keep a child in that sort of curious behavior of like, well, I wonder if this will work. And then, you know, getting to that. And by the time they get that thing working, they're asking two or three more questions, right? Like, oh, well, wait, can I, you know, it, will it be louder if I add this rubber band? Will it hold together better if I use this tape? We want them to keep asking those questions. So, um, so our first product, this came out a few years ago, and you can buy it on Amazon, and um, uh, is called the Electric Motors Catalyst, right? And you you can see we even designed the box 
to kind of explain what it was. Like inside this box, you're going to find parts and some pens and some wheels, and it's got some encouragement on one side. Um, it's got a little bit, uh, you sometimes need to bolster the courage of parents and teachers, and it says like, we're not going to give you instructions, but there are 10 challenges in this box. You know, and we mostly find like those are like training wheels to get you in the right mindset. Right. When you open the box. Now, the interesting thing about this box is it gets manufactured in China, assembled there and shipped in shipping containers. And you can fit exactly 5000 of these in a standard shipping container. Oh, oh, oh the of the completed box of the whole the thing. Wow. Box. Wow. That's yeah. It comes to the U.S. <laughs> Yeah. in a shipping container in what they call loose packed. So it exactly fills the inside instead of being on pallets. Right, so right. Maximize the use of the shipping container. Yeah, interesting fact, interesting criteria there. For yeah. Your, for so the, the trim size of your box. Yeah, the shipping container comes to an offload service that palletizes them and ships them in pallets to the Amazon distribution centers. Mm -hmm. So. So that's like just an industrial yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. As you open the box, reveals like more parts and things like that. But then there's something called the pack order, which is how do you meet the parts inside the box? Mm -hmm. So the first thing is like, hey, let's be safe about this. You know, that's, that's that. Then there's a little product update <laughs> that explains to you how to assemble your motors. Whoops, it's upside down. And oh, it's all upside down. Sorry about that. <laughs> And then here's the, here's the book, right? And the book has a kind of design that echoes all of the design elements of the box. It has the signatures of everybody who helped design it and you can see who we are. And then it just has, you know, takes you through getting started with the kit. Now, when you give the box to a kid, the first thing they do is just put that over yeah, there. Exactly. Right? And then, oh. I must have opened this before because everything is like alternating directions. There's a bag and it makes noise because it's full of parts. And then there's a box that says, you know, it's full of motors, wires, and wooden parts, right? So that's cool. And then also in here are safety goggles, right? Which is fun. So, uh, of these things has its own like had to be designed packing solution so the wooden parts come in what's called a, a bubble sack which is a bubble wrap pocket that keeps the wooden parts which are laser cut from marking up anything else in the box with their slightly right. um, you know smoky edges and then inside here <laughs> are the two most exciting parts, which are these motors, which are um, just cased in plastic to protect the wire connections and to pass um, US safety standards. Mm -hmm. so, so that's that. So as you go through the box, you find all these real parts and, and materials and uh, kids have built, you know, just incredible contraptions out of this. But the true magic, I think, of the catalyst, like if you compare it to Lego, which is this whole building ecosystem, right? right. The catalyst turns your house into extra supplies for the catalyst. Whereas the Lego defines this walled garden, you know, these parts interface with each other, but they kind of hate the real world. The catalyst was designed to make the kitchen drawer full of junk be like, I bet we have a cork in the kitchen drawer. You know, you right. run over and get that. And while you're there, you see like, oh, wait, there's some twist ties. I need those too. And you, you know, <laughs> you come back. So I wanted when kids open this box and start playing with the materials inside for them to always to start cataloging unconsciously all of the resources of their environment, right? Like, don't throw out that toilet paper tube. I need that for my steamroller, you know? Right, because it connects to the idea of a motor and it's round and it can, and it can roll. Yeah. Or, um, the, yeah. yeah, those. Everything that's round is fascinating. Um, 
Uh, but also, I mean, it, the kit is designed, it, it has bolts and screws that you can put things together with, but it kind of encourages you to do rapid prototyping. So it's got these uh, beautiful, um, to, uh, yeah, let's just open this bag for one second. Sure. Um, uh, it comes with a screwdriver. Wow. You which, don't even need to go to the drawer for that. Yeah. A lot of kids, that's the first screwdriver in their house. Like wow. their house doesn't have a screwdriver in it. Yeah, yeah. Comes with three pens, but that's mostly because in classrooms, uh, there often aren't enough pens for kids, we found out. Um, and uh, it comes with one of my favorite things, which is we just sourced these beautiful orange rubber bands. Uh -huh. which, you know, it's one of those things like, was it important that they be orange? No. Um, but it, but does it bring joy? Yes. Yeah. Does it bring joy? And does it, there's like the functionality it, together. You know, the motors are orange. The, you know, we chose this orange as like one of our connecting colors, you know. Um, one of the things I love is one of your rubber bands, like it comes shipped like this. One of your rubber bands, the job is to hold the little can of loose parts together. And then the loose parts come apart and it, presents itself as two trays that you can, like when you're building, you right. ultimately end up using a, both sides of this for organization. Right. And then when you want to put everything away, you just dump it back in. So it, it, I really like, um, I love that our manufacturing partner suggested this, right? They were like, why don't, you know, we were yeah. trying to figure out where we're going to use a little piece of tape to hold it together. And, uh, the, the partner just suggested that yeah. as like something they could do at their factory. Right, so, right. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 is that this, the, so, but then you have an, is that the newest one where you're, where you have your like little programming paddle? No, <laughs> I'm going to bring this over and this is in okay. my total okay. prototype state. So give me okay. that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Ooh, <laughs> gave her at work. Yeah. Wow. So I often have a couple of projects going at once. And one of the problems is like, how do you organize your projects, right? And so uh, I'll have um, a project on this board. And then I have a separate desk over there where I have another project that's active. And then if I need more than that, I make myself put the project in a box. Yeah. So that, I, yeah. Yeah, I can preserve the current state of it and work on it. Okay. So this is a little bit of a, this is a sneak preview uh, unseen by the rest of the world. Um, but, uh, Gaver at work. <laughs> um, okay. And you can see it's all just held together with painter's tape and, right, right. Like various things here. Um, all right, so the first thing to notice is, is this wheel with these little tabs. These are called the programming tabs. Mm -hmm. And um, you can arrange them however you like around the wheel to create a pattern. And when I turn this on, uh, a motor turns those paddles and they go through a little sensor that says uh, on or off. And mm -hmm. if it's on, it makes a circuit over here on one of these connectors. And if it's off, then there's no energy going through there. Zeros and ones. Zeros and ones. Okay, so this whole section in here is all super prototypey electronics for something that will turn into a tiny postage stamp mm -hmm. on the end of a solenoid. Uh, a solenoid is like a little electric hammer. And um, I think I have one right here, yeah a little electric hammer that will hit things when it gets power. Mm -hmm. And um, you can see that right here. It's got like a little oh, yeah. that comes out. Yeah. So, uh, so that controls that. So if I start to add power uh, and turn on the various components, what am I missing? Oh, I'm missing your power. Hold on one second. Um, dun, 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 dun. There it is. I just had to find the right cable. Okay. 
So this is getting ready to go to manufacturing. We're probably a month away from that. Wow. Um, and will you use your same uh, manufacturer in China that you've been working with? Yep. That you've clearly built a good, uh, nice relationship with. Yeah, and they they use they're lead certified. They use um, uh, sustainably grown hardwoods for their plywood and mm -hmm. and um, uh, recyclable plastics for the manufacturing. And it, it's really it, they've just been an incredible uh, partner. Okay, so uh, that's on. This is on. What what did I forget here? Why aren't you going? This is the problem with a prototype, right? Is right. Uh, you, you sort of get, oh, you know what I did is I didn't turn this off last night. Hold on one second. I think I just have to replace these. Oh yeah, one of these batteries is uh, expanding. That's why, okay. Uh, uh, uh. Gabriel, if you don't have them, that's okay. You can tell us what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I love just seeing this and the yeah. concept behind yeah. it. It's great. So uh, every time one of those tabs goes by, one yep. of these hammers over here would be activated. And these are loose, and you can arrange them however you want. Uh -huh. So when, it, when that hammer activates in this little experiment. Yep. That one's not, yeah. So it plays a little song based right. on the tabs that you did here. The other thing we've seen our, uh, in our tests, the other things we've done is these can turn on and off motors. And so your little robot can go and like draw a pattern, you know, uh -huh. or write your name because you programmed it right. using tabs. So, right. Um, and so it's this very kind of foundational way to build in the concept of programming. Exactly. Uh, that you're turning circuits on and off and those circuits are driving what you choose to drive and to that me. how you set up the pattern of the circuits of the on and off you're doing with those little yeah. paddles that you poke into the wheel yeah. i mean it's, that's it's, exactly it it's so it's such a lovely way to bring electrons out into this world and i think this whole relationship of everything you're doing in tinkering school and with building but real but it also is always intrinsic kind of connected back into our electronic world and the world of zeros and ones uh, because that is how we operate but you can't you can't just be in one or the other right. and 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 figuring out these new ways and different ways to go between these worlds is just super fascinating and, and when, uh, how do we always you know the I think one thing that's really important in tinkering school is that we try to always frame the computer as another tool. It's, you know, and, and if you're just sitting there like watching your computer, you might as well have a television, right? But the computer is this way now to, to manipulate physical things as well. You know, the laser cutter that produces these parts, you know, that's a design. And, and the tools for making these things so that they fit together and make these systems, well, that's, that, that's, an, uh, that's a kind of like design thinking problem of how is the child gonna assemble this? How is it gonna come together at the factory? All those things get merged together and you end up at the end with a product that changes how kids approach the world. You know, what we see is kids who get the catalyst start to look at the world with their screwdriver in their hand and like, how do I change? <laughs> right, it's problem solving that's connected to material things yeah. as well as yeah. 
So can you just add one more little thing is your relationship to drawing through all of these, you know, you've shown us all this iterative, it's right there next to you, iterate, you're yeah. building, you're thinking through things. And I, I feel like there's a, a, a relationship to sketching or to your pen and paper that is. is kind of fundamental, foundational to a lot of this. Um, I, I think I, like the conversation that I'm having in my head is better when it's expressed on paper. Like now I can really look at the problem, right? And, and um, you know, if you, I'll just hold up my notebook because I always have it nearby. Yeah. Right? So here's a page where I've got some Mars stuff going on, but I've also, this is like a shopping list, right? <laughs> like um, I need to get some, I need to get some sand and a screwdriver, a special screwdriver and a step ladder and also get some fresh corn, you know. Right, right, right. <laughs> stuff. But you can see, like, I, I was probably having a conversation with one of the students about the new wheel. And I often find <clears throat> uh, kids will come to me with a new idea and they're waving their hands around and stuff like that. And I say, like, you know, I, I start to put my pen on the paper and I say, well, like, are you saying something like this? And suddenly they realize like their words have described something completely unrelated to what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. Right. Like they're making the assumption that somehow I can see into their brain and they take the pencil out of my hand and they start, no, it's more like this. Oh. <laughs> you know, and and um, uh, I love those conversations where you can see, oh yeah, but, but I, I just want to also say that that conversation between you and your student, where the pencil is the true communicator, yeah. is, I think every designer will say is so important to that collaborative process with a client, with fabricators, with uh, all these different partners, because you're not relying on these different realities in here, you're all looking at the same thing. So that facility. That's exactly it. And I think that, um, you know, the, the, it's about communication, right? Either with yourself or, or with somebody else. And if, if they're hearing your words and not understanding you, then your words aren't doing the job, right? And I find, you know, in 99% of the cases, if I can just, even when I was just writing code for a living, if I'm trying to get a room full of people to understand the big idea, I'm going to draw it on the whiteboard. Yep. Right. And they're going to realize like, no, you've got it wrong. Yes. I understand what you're saying. You're missing this part. All of those things come out so much more quickly if we're talking with our pens. Right. And so I'm never anywhere without my notebook. You know, I have a whole shelf over there full of notebooks. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I believe that the notebook makes me uh, easily uh, twice as good at my job as I would be without it, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm always encouraging my students to take up the practice. Yeah, oh good. Well, that's, I love, I love hearing that because it, it, that I think holds true across so many disciplines. Um, yeah. So, well, um, Gaver, I feel like we could go on and on. We haven't even touched on Brightworks, on um, your pre, um, but maybe you could just for, for the students in, in, in DES 570, talk a little bit about if you have internships at, at um, who your students are or who you're working with. Um, and if you have internships at, um, at Tinkering School or at Brightworks. So, um... Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because I was uh, I was trying to remember to do that. Um, I uh, we love working with uh, college students. Um, we offer summer intern paid internships at uh, Tinkering School. You'll work with students. You'll work with me and the staff. <clears throat> uh, you'll work with me and the staff to not only. Um, design, co-design the program, but to, uh, to reflect back each week and, and do our regular practice uh, that we call pluses and deltas 
which is looking at what we just did in the context of having just done it and figuring out what we can do to improve the next week. And iteration. <laughs> iterations. And so we're still iterating. The, right. There's plenty of room for improvement and, and uh, it, it, for our staff and our students who are also get to participate in these sessions. Um, it's one of our favorite parts is, is the actual act of co-creating, figuring out what we're going to do next. And it, it is, it is that continuous iteration process. We're never done. Yeah. Wow. Well, that um, is a great way to kind of wrap it up. I just, I think your infectious enthusiasm for, for fostering curiosity, for yeah. fostering problem solving in, um, you know, kids of all ages is super um, exciting and it's super important. I think it's, I just think um, one thing you mentioned is that your Brightworks kids, the elementary school kids are all going to school in Golden Gate Park every day. That's right. And so that connection to the world is um, not going anywhere, even in COVID is super, super important. And yeah. Um, so I will hopefully, you know, maybe we can get you into the class as the semester progresses. I will turn the students onto the Tinkering School website um, for sure. And um, gave her this, you know, connection to San Francisco State and this whole group of design students, I think is really exciting. And yeah, hopefully if, can. If, there, if there are any of your students who want to learn more about how the summer internships work, um, uh, the training program and all of that. Um, if they just, you know, if they just mail you and you forward to me, yeah. And um, Karen on my side will will mail them back, and it's a yeah. it's a one on one thing. It's you're not you're not a face in a crowd. We yeah. We see everyone as an individual. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure it wouldn't be otherwise. Um, okay. Well, gave her. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank I, you. Um, we see more of you and um, I want to see the next, I want to see the clamshell Mars Rover. Okay. When that, when that gets, uh, when those get yeah. you know, finalized. Uh, it's great to be here, Josie.